Lombardo is no uh, no stranger to geology. He's been a geologist for more than 35 years. And in fact, he was uh, also um, 16 years. He managed the, let's see, what is it? The Southern Nevada <clears throat> Office of the Nevada Division of Minerals. He's got quite an extensive background in uh, gems and minerals also. And uh, specialty, you know, um, exploration for uranium, gallium, and uh, germanium, which now um, they're rare. You know, <clears throat> rare metals are, are very interesting in the way that they use them. Rare metals are also colorants of glass in some situations. But he now he has his Nevada Mineral and Book Company, which is a science and uh, science shop for books and minerals. And he's got some jewelry in there and some little Native American carvings. I've probably known Walt for well, a little over 20 years. Least, I used yeah. to buy books from him when I was the actually the acquisitions librarian at GIA. That's how I first met Walt, because he just had he was such a resource of mineral mineral exploration where to find it, and then you can figure out what to do with it yourself. But he's got maps in there that goes back, go back probably what, a hundred years or more? Oh, I've got some that are probably 180, something like that. You know, if, if there's some odd thing that somebody's looking for, um, he could probably turn it over for you. In fact, I've had other people call me and he's done that. But, um, so, um, and I've also worked with Walt and helped him at shows and in the shop. And he's been, um, been a good friend and a very, very knowledgeable person about a number of subjects. And tonight it will be, you know, mind the masterpiece. What, what does it take to color a piece of glass? You know, they a big deal, but there's a lot that goes into it because some colors that start out one way don't end up the other. So I would very much like to present you my friend and very knowledgeable person, Walter Lombardo. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think I'll start by, let me try to share the screen here so I can get to the talk, hopefully. All right, can everyone see that? Yes, <clears throat> well, I can. Well, all right, as long as, as long as I know somebody can, then everyone can. I'm gonna start the slideshow, get it set, set up from the beginning. All right, um, this is was kind of a an interesting project that I actually started about, I think it was around 1996, I got interested in the minerals used in making glass. Um, when I was with the state of Nevada, I would do an exhibit and a lecture series every year for the Clark County Museum in, in Henderson, Nevada. And we always did something on minerals. We tied in between the museum and the uh, Friends of Mineralogy organization. And <clears throat> we had done a talk in a, a museum exhibit basically on pigmentite minerals, which you know everyone around here knows what pigmentites are, but um, unfortunately the general public really doesn't know much about that. We had beautiful exhibits. We had loaner pieces from the Smithsonian. We actually, Michael Wise, who's the pigmentite researcher from the Smithsonian came out and we had all kinds of things. And honestly, it was not very well attended. Uh, the exhibit went for two months. <clears throat> it wasn't really well received. And we realized it was because even though we know what we had, the general public didn't. <clears throat> and I had to sit down with the museum curator to just kind of, you know, discuss the exhibit and then plan towards the next. And we decided we need to really come up with something that you could market to the masses as far as education, something where, you know, minerals were used in society that would be relevant to people. You know, pigmentites were a little bit esoteric. Obviously, gemstones are important and some rare metals, but didn't really catch on with the general public. So um, <clears throat> shortly after my meeting, uh, a, a family member passed away, had to go to a funeral <clears throat> in uh, Massachusetts. And while I was back there, my uh, <clears throat> wife at the time and I spent some time in New England hitting antique shops, which they're classic. And we went in this little old red barn, and I think it was along the Massachusetts-Connecticut border. And <clears throat> it's close to my mom's birthday. My mom liked antiques, and she kind of liked the antique glass. She picked that up for my grandmother. And so we're in there, and I found this really cool little blue opalescent bowl. And you know, I just, I figured she liked, she'd like the color and she liked glass. So I just get it for her. I bring it up to the counter 
And uh, the woman behind the counter said, oh, that's a nice Fenton piece. I had no idea what Fenton was. And she explained it to me that it was a well-known glass company out of West Virginia and all that. So I thought, oh, that's nice. And I bought the piece. The next week we went back home to Nevada. I was living in Las Vegas at the time. And there was a new store opening in one of the big malls. And my, my wife at the time wanted to, to go. It was a place called Wicks and Sticks. I don't think they exist anymore, but they did candles and they did glass. And so we went in there and she's looking at the candles and all this stuff. And I'm just, you know, killing time. And I see this stand of books, a little display of books and uh, glass next to it. Turned out it was Fenton Art Glass Company. Well, Fenton was a name I just heard for the first time a few weeks before. And now I see it again. I see all this glass and they had some books on the history of the company. And just thumbing through one of the books, there was a whole chapter on how minerals are used as colorants in the glass. And it turns out Fenton was a very innovative company going back to the early 1900s. And they had a glass chemist who had come up with these great uh, formulas for making these wild colors of glass. And so that got me thinking about an exhibit. So I spent a year working on a glass exhibit for the, the County Museum uh, you know, exhibit the following year. I think I spent probably eight or $10,000 out of my own pocket buying glass. I think I ended up with about 150 books on glass. And so that from there, I became a glass collector, mostly because of the colors and history of the US uh, glass industry. So anyway, this talk is kind of based on that exhibit. In fact, in last year or two, I've been thinking about resurrecting. It's been 20 years since that's done. That's been sitting in boxes in my garage for all that time. So I'm actually thinking about resurrecting it. Anyway, so <clears throat> what I'll talk about tonight is just how minerals are used. Number one, to make glass and they're used as colorants, uh, particularly in art and decorative glass. And there are huge similarities between the elements that are used to color glass and the same, almost all the same elements are used to color gemstone. So it's pretty relevant to uh, the mineral field for a number of reasons. Anyway, um, I had a chance to travel quite a bit with my jobs. Um, this was a photograph from uh, Prague. I had a chance uh, on several occasions to go to the Czech Republic on business. And Czech is a very, the you know, Czech Republic is a very well-known uh, glass making center. And I was fortunate I did get to visit two glass factories there. Um, I was able to visit the Fenton Art Glass Factory in West Virginia. I actually was able to meet with the glass chemist, get a tour. Uh, so, you know, there'll be some things in here that, that relate to that. But um, this is a great photograph of uh, beautiful European glass. Uh, Moser is a very famous company in Europe. Uh, they're highly regarded. Uh, in fact, I didn't realize this, but the Stanley Cup, the, the, the hockey trophy is made uh, by the Moser Glass Company, which I thought was really interesting. Anyway, uh, first we should do some definitions on what is a glass. You know, basically it's, well, this is the kind of very thing. It's a fused amorphous mixture of silicates made from silica, which is quartz, and various alkalis, alkali earths and metal oxides and salt. Basically it's a combination of quartz, a few other minerals and some metals. And there's several types of glass. There's natural glass. Uh, that category would be things like obsidian, tectites, and fulgurites. You know, tectites, of course, are from asteroid impacts, and fulgurites are caused by lightning strikes. And then we have man-made glasses. <clears throat> you know, we have our typical glass we think of. We have slag, which is a waste product from industrial processes like um, particularly metal mining, like refining of iron and things like that. And then there are some glasses that are formed uh, from actually nuclear weapons de definition. The most famous one is called Trinitite, which is a glass from the White Sands uh, range in New Mexico, which is where the first atomic testing took place. Okay, glass history goes back thousands and thousands of years. I, I think there are glass items that, are, that have been found that are about 5,000 years old. Okay, this is a beautiful piece of, of Egyptian glass. This is um, around 350 AD. You can see 
I, I would expect in some glass shop today, I could find a piece very similar to this. So glass technology and the artistic, you know, um, variety of glass making is very old. And so, you know, this is a, a wonderful piece, but yeah, I mean, you can see people making stuff like this piece today. Okay, just to go back, it is thought that uh, Mesopotamia, you know, basically current day Iraq, you know, that area probably was the origin of glass making around 2500 BC. Um, by the year 2000 BC, um, it was common in Egypt, especially in, in the tombs of uh, some of the Egyptian uh, ruling class, the Phoenicians, you know, they're around Syria. Uh, they were making glass and transporting it through the Middle East and into along the Mediterranean. The Romans were very big on glass making. Uh, Roman glass is being found archaeological sites all over Europe, Middle East, and even into parts of Asia. I know there's uh, some well-known sites for exit. I've actually bought some pieces of uh, what they call quote Roman glass that were found as far uh, into Asia as Afghanistan. So it was a very important commodity. Um, it's interesting, an Arab chemist by the name of Gerber uh, wrote a book on glass chemistry in 800 AD. And this is the earliest known example of research on glass making. And he recorded formulas, he wrote about his experiments. So again, this is, you know, 1300 years ago. So glass was a very important item uh, in manufacturing, food preservation, uh, art, had a lot of uses in society. And of course, let's say food storage, wine, drink storage, olive oil, things like that, were all ways that was used sort of in utilitarian ways but also was used in a very decorative way as well, because again, like gemstones, these things are beautiful. And I think glass reminded people of gemstones and yet was uh, more affordable. And plus you make them much larger. Okay, here's an example of uh, glass that was found in Syria. It's about from about 300 AD. This will be quote the Roman era, if you want to call it that in the Middle East and, and Europe. And one thing you'll notice about it right away, it has a very interesting patina. Since glass is somewhat amorphous, doesn't have a true crystal structure, it, it will tend to break down over time. And this glass being buried in the ground for, you know, say almost 2000 years, the groundwater uh, chemicals in the soil from plants and decomposition of plants and other things start to work on the glass and it'll start to uh, deteriorate. And usually what happens is it's what's called devitrify. You'll have some of the metals and other things that will basically come out of the glass and separate from the glass, which is what you're seeing here. Um, a lot of <clears throat> museums, archeology span groups were very popular in the late 1800s. And that exposed this ancient glass to the masses in, in the United States and Europe. And this sort of beautiful iridescent glass, which would remind you of, you know, opal or, you know, fire agate or something like that, was just stunning. And so the, there was an attempt by glassmakers to emulate this glass um, in, you know, modern manufacturing. So if anyone's familiar with the iridescent glass or carnival glass, as we call it now, from the late 1890s and early 1900s, glass companies were trying to emulate the look of this ancient glass that was shown in museum exhibits. Um, sorry, this is out of order. I'll talk about this later. Stained glass was also very important use for glass, especially in you know, churches and uh, <clears throat> synagogues in Europe and Middle East for, for a long time. So that was another way that uh, glass technology improved go back to this, um, <clears throat> this emulation of the ancient glass. This is a piece uh, that, called Favril. That was the trade name for this glass. It was made by Tiffany and Company. Uh, Tiffany were known as jewelers, but actually they were also expert glass makers, especially in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And they were one of the first companies to come out with an iridescent glass that 
looked like these ancient glasses that had been on exhibit. And this glass was very expensive to produce. And um, to this day, are quite valuable. You know, a piece like this might be in the several thousands of dollars ranges. This may have been made around like 1905 or something like that. But very, very desirable and a uh, very high quality glass. Okay, this is another interesting style. Um, this is a piece that was made in the, between 1900 and 1910. This is called a pint vase where they've taken the glass and as it's still molten, they take a pair of like crimpers almost and, and kind of compress the glass a little bit. Well, this is called the Pompeii style because again, the uh, ex there are a lot of exhibits showing artifacts from Pompeii that was being discovered in the late 1800s. And this was a type of glass that was found there. So again, a lot of this, say the late 19th century glass technology was done in part to emulate you know, some of these ancient uh, types of glasses, particularly in art glass field. Anyway, let's, let's just kind of a neat aside is how the correlation between ancient glass and modern glass happened. Um, go back to glass chemistry a little bit here. And there's three major types of glass. Actually, it's the fourth one, but uh, it's a little bit different. We'll talk about that later. But uh, the most common is called the soda glass or soda lime glass. This is common glass. It's been used for thousands of years. Um, we see it mostly in things like windows, you know, bottles, uh, you know, inexpensive dishes, things like that. It's composed of about 70% quartz or silica has a little bit of what they call soda ash, which is uh, <clears throat> basically sodium oxide. It has limestone, basically calcium oxide, also known as lime, and a little bit of alumina, feldspar, barite, lithium, zinc oxide, things like that. So this is the most common glass that you'll see. Say all your windows are made out of that, your drinking glasses and that kind of stuff. And say this, these formulas have been modified, but basically have been around for good 4,000 years. Now, in the 14th century, in Venice, which was a big glass making center in Europe in the Middle Ages and beyond that, um, someone discovered that you, you could add manganese to glass and it would make it look crystal clear. Uh, based like rock crystals, like quartz, okay? And the manganese was known as a clarifier. What it would do is it would take impurities out of the glass, okay? Uh, especially uh, stray elements like iron. A lot of uh, the sand itself would have a little bit of iron in it, and that would tend to make the glass look kind of a greenish or brownish color. Uh, the more iron you have in the sand, the darker the glass. So you can go from sort of a yellow brown to dark brown to green to very dark green almost to black and so someone figured out we could make it look clear by adding manganese and you know up at this time they were taking quartz and rock crystal and making it into goblets and they were like extremely expensive this was a very sort of inexpensive alternative to that and it made for a very nice high quality glass now in 1600s, mid 1600s, an English uh, chemist by the name of George Ravencroft came up with the idea of adding lead oxide to glass. And that made a very brilliant and highly refractive, refractive glass. Um, basically, if you see leaded glass today, it's say up to 24% lead oxide or something like that in it. This is the, the glass that he developed. It was beautiful. It had that uh, sort of dispersion that you're tip, you know, typically would see in diamonds, you know, the gemstones and things like that. And uh, quite neat. The only problem with leaded glass though is lead can leach out of the glass. Just like, you know, earlier I showed you, if you put very glass, common glass in the ground for long periods of time, the metals will start to leach out. Well, lead's no exception. And when you put things like uh, wine, you know, anything acidic, say you did orange juice, tomato juice, put it in leaded glass, you're gonna get a little bit of lead will leach out and you'll be consuming it. So now some of these modern leaded glasses will use titanium dioxide or 
zirconium dioxide in place of the lead. It still has a high refractive index, but it doesn't have the toxic effects that say um, that uh, lead would have. Like for example, titanium dioxide would is basically, <clears throat> you know, there's several titanium minerals, root field one, um, titanate, you know, is, is one. And those do have a high refractive index. Zirconium is found in zircon, also in cubic zirconia. So that also has high refractive index, which is why, again, it's a good replacement for lead. Now there's another type of, of glass. They call it crown glass. This is an optical glass. This would be things like you're used in your glasses and binoculars and telescopes. Um, they add uh, potash or potassium oxide to the mix to lower the refractive index because anytime you, you know, glass like any other mineral has a refractive index, as light goes through it, it's altered, it's bent some way. You now the higher the refractive index, the more light is bent. Well, if you're using it for a lens, you don't want that lens, that light being distorted, basically bent or distorted. So if you're wearing glasses, if you have binoculars, you want everything nice and crisp and sharp. So they found that by adding potash to the glass, they could get something with very low refractive index so you don't get distortion. Pretty key. Okay, the one I'm not gonna talk to you about is there's borosilicate glasses, which are you know like fiberglass and uh, certain high temperature glasses where they've had boron for things. That's of that's for another one. Anyway, um, the most important ingredient in glass is basically quartz sand. That is, without that, you can't do anything. So most sand deposits have iron in it as an impurity. So the key is if you're making glass is to get the cleanest sand with the least amount of glass in it. So you want really white, white sand if possible. Um, now you can use marginal sands if you're making real cheap glass like say you want to make beer bottle glass or something like that, where it doesn't have to be really clear. You don't care about the color. You have various shades of greens or browns or whatever. But for the most part, in, especially in today's industrial processes, you want a nice clean glass. So you want it to be pretty clear. Anyway, well, so we yes. Had a, we had a question. Um, when was the cutoff date from when they eliminated lead in wine glasses? You know, it depends on the country. I think in the U.S. it started in probably the late 70s, early 80s. But, you know, I'm sure there are still countries that use it. So you have to be a little bit careful or with older glass. And again, you know, we're talking a very small amount. But if you drink your orange juice from leaded glass in the morning and you drink your wine from leaded glass at night and you do that for a long period of time, you will get some lead exposure. So, you know, there are... I would, you know, you could probably use it for water uh, without too much concern, but yeah, anything acidic, say orange juice, tomato juice, wine, you will get a little bit of leaching of the glass. So, you know, I don't really recommend it for those purposes. It's much better to use leaded glass in your chandeliers than it is in drinking glasses. Anyway, but yeah, I think, you know, um, in some third world countries, might still use lead in their glass. Um, China, God knows what they put in there. You know, you have to be a little careful there. Uh, but I think most of Europe, you know, North America has, you know, changed the the rules for, you know, leaded glass, what it could be used for and how it could be marketed. But yeah, just be a little careful if you have say, you know, older glass, vintage or antique glass, you know, and how you use it, if you use it as an everyday item. Okay, since most sand does have some iron in it, they have to have minerals that will clarify or take the iron out, bind to it so that it, the glass is clear rather than you know, various shades of colors, particularly the browns and the, the uh, greens. Okay, so there's two uh, elements that have been found to be good clarifiers. One is manganese and the other is selenium. Um, they both work very well. They have a little different effect on the outcome of the glass, however. Um, 
Anyway, here's your common glass. These are kinds of things you'd see. This would be fairly inexpensive. They don't bother for the expense of adding clarifiers to the glass. This would be pretty much based on the sand. Now, if you saw the sand these came from, they'd still be very white. You could have maybe, you know, a, a 0.5% iron in the sand, which is, you know, not very much. And that'd be enough to give it these kind of colors. So even what looks like pure white sand usually has a little bit of iron impurity in it. So it's got to be ultra clear, you know, glass, then you've got to add the clarifiers. Okay, now here's an interesting one that up until about 1918, manganese was the element that was used as a clarifier. Uh, during World War I, manganese became very hard to, to find. Um, you know, with the war going on, shipping lanes were being blocked, or chips were being blown up and all that kind of thing or, or captured. Um, the main sources of manganese were places like Russia, uh, South Africa, you know, a few other places. And the material had to be sent for the most part to companies by ship, to countries by ship. So we couldn't find it. So they found out that selenium worked pretty well. So because of the shortage of manganese, we shifted to selenium and found out that was more expensive and more readily available. You didn't have the supply problems from manganese. As it turns out, one interesting characteristic of adding manganese to glass is it became um, photoreactive. Basically, the glass over time would react to ultraviolet light. And so anyone who's seen what they call desert glass, you know, the purple glass you see out, you know, ghost towns and things like that, that is the result of manganese being the clarifier. So any glass that was made before, say, 1918, um, you know, if it's left exposed to the sun long enough, it will turn purple. Now, there's been a real interesting thing in recent years. People are taking glass old glass and exposing it to ultraviolet light. You know, you can buy little ultraviolet units easily and they'll turn the glass purple and, you know, it's more desirable color so they can increase the price. And I think in China, they're probably making fake antiques using manganese as a clarifier just to make glass that looks old by turning it purple. So you'd have to be careful if you're a collector to know your glass a little bit because there's a lot of fakes out there. So basically, let's just show you the difference. It's kind of a cool one, too. So you can kind of, for the most part, take glass, you know, by this historic event when manganese became unavailable. So archaeologists, say, urban archaeologists, more recent archaeologists will use this as a little tool to try to date, you know, some of these uh, refuge middens and things like that. Okay. We'll talk, we talked a little bit about uh, the glass types. Uh, this typical one is a soda lime glass. This is pretty much a utilitarian glass, say used for, for windows, used for our typical glassware, um, you know, bottles and things like that. Um, it's, it's considered fairly soft. Okay, there's an interesting formula that kind of give you, it's a basically a sodium calcium, you know, silicate. Um, it is resistant to water but it does melt easily. And that's pretty good uh, for recycling. Okay, this kind of glass can melt, so it can be recycled. This is typically why you see, you know, bottles being collected. Um, one thing though, this type of glass is easily attacked by acids. So that's, you know, what happened to the Roman glass, things like that are buried in the soil for so long. They are altered by that. Okay. This was a glass, I'm gonna show you some glass formulas. These are really cool. There's some, some glass formulas for in many cases were considered trade secrets or even state secrets. Uh, interesting story uh, in one of the city states in Italy in um, basically Murano, which is still a glass making center in like the 15th, 16th century and 17th century Anyone who was caught leaking secrets of glassmaking, um, the penalty was uh, execution. Basically, it was a capital offense to leak a state trade secret on glassmaking techniques. And the Italians in Murano had 
an incredible lead on the rest of Europe in glass manufacturing as far as quality, cost, and things like that. And they were like the, the leader in all of Europe and the Middle East for glass making for quite a while. At some point, the English were able to steal some of the secrets of glass making from Murano, and they end up becoming a main competitor of the Italians like in the 17th, 18th century. And by that time, things started to spread pretty far and wide. So uh, most countries started to have very you know, large and important glass making uh, operations. But uh, here's interesting, in the late you know, 1890s, early 1900s, there was a, a glass making family, actually uh, Thomas, this is from Thomas Dugan's actual journals where he recorded all his formulas. Interesting, a lot of the glass makers, they're, they would destroy their journals when they were, you know, thought they were gonna die or they'd have their family member or somebody destroy it. So those secrets never got out. So a lot of glass formulas that were lost forever, but Thomas Dugan decided to preserve his. And so we have a pretty good idea of these formulas like from the late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, pretty interesting, if you look at this, you'll recognize some of these things. Um, of course, this is a formula. Basically, it's about, oh, uh, this is considered one batch, was uh, probably about a thousand pounds of, uh, you know, material when making a batch of glass. And so you've got sand. This one's a flint glass, so you got a little bit of lead in it. So here you've got, it's kind of interesting, you have 530 pounds of sand, and you have 250 pounds of lead. So by weight, the lead accounts for about one third of the weight of the glass. It's pretty interesting. You got bicarbonate of soda, you've got pearls, which is actually, um, that is what we call dolomite, calcium magnesium carbonate. As saltpeter, which is uh, basically sodium nitrate. Uh, manganese, there's you know a lot of minerals that would have manganese in it. A little bit of arsenic, and borax. Um, borax and arsenic were used primarily as uh, fluxes, especially the borax helped the glass, uh, it would help the, the glass melt at a little lower temperature because, you know, sand is, quartz sand is, melts at a fairly high temperature, a couple thousand degrees Fahrenheit. But by adding some of these other minerals, you can actually reduce the melting point a little bit. And uh, he had a little commentary that's a little bit expensive, but a very good leaded glass, basically. So this was probably the Dugan Glass Company, which was a well-known American glass company in the late 1800s, early 1900s. This would have been one of their primary formulas for making leaded glass. Okay. One thing about, you know, leaded glass is expensive compared to regular glass, whether it's with lead or now titanium dioxide or other things in it. And, Glass is fairly soft and it can be cut. Um, I had the opportunity, I was in the Czech Republic on business for a mining company. I was able to arrange a day to go to a glass company in uh, the Bohemia portion of the Czech Republic. And I uh, actually got to see glass makers at work. In this case, it's a cutting house where they're cutting glass. And if you look at that, this guy's a lapidary, okay? He's hand cutting glass on probably a tungsten carbide or carborundum wheel. You don't need diamond for glass so much because it's a lot softer than a lot of minerals. But anyway, this guy was skilled in making patterned glass, you know, hand cut. These guys are, are wonderful. And uh, this uh, particular company is called the Ruckel Glass Company. It's R-U-C-K-L. It was a German family who um, actually relocated the Czech Republic around the time of World War II two and establish a very well-known glass making firm there. Uh, interesting thing about Ruckel, and I think I've got a piece, there's some stuff. Their glass is very well known, it's high quality. The workmanship was high quality. They are the ones who actually make Waterford glass. That wonderful Irish glass that everyone loves is made in the Czech Republic. And it's sent back to uh, Ireland. They box it and put their little sticker on it. But the glass itself for Waterford, which is one of the premier, you know, glass brands in the world, is actually now made by this factory in the Czech Republic. So I was real fortunate to get to go visit. And uh, I actually got to see, I was the gentleman in this previous picture. 
on the other side of his desk, he has a blueprint. And um, I promised I would never show it, but it actually, it's the pattern that he's cutting on that wheel. And at the he header, it says Waterford Glass. So anyway, let's see. Okay. Um, probably one of the best things to do is mix glass so interesting as the colors that are found in it. And there's a lot of elements that are used. Um, usually they're the transition elements, which are one particular group of elements in the periodic table. These are, whether it's gemstones, glass, most other things, these are the elements that color things um, because they have electrons that can be shared and, and move pretty easily back and forth. And so, um, again, the same elements that would col color gemstones color this glass, like here, iron oxides. Okay, this is something that's naturally found in most of the sands that are used in glass making. Um, you'll see typically greens and you know browns and things like that. Um, and you can remove them with clarifiers. But what's interesting, um, iron oxides produce lots of uh, colors in gemstones, for example. Um, a lot of greens, browns in uh, most gems are probably caused by iron oxides. Okay, if you have a barrel, a green barrel, it generally has a little bit of iron in it. Um, a lot of the, you know, well, quite a few do. Even things like, uh, you know, some sapphires have got a little bit of iron in it that would, would give it, say, the green colors and the yellows and things like that, orange colors. All right, let's see for that. Um, this is one of the most typical colors of glass, sort of amber brown. Um, it's pretty color. Again, there's, there's a small amount of iron in it compared to some of the others. Um, I'm going to make an aside here too. For those of you who are familiar with tectites, which is another you know natural glass, the ones that are formed by asteroid impacts, um, you can see the transition, basically the sequence of increasing uh, iron content and looking at different types of tectites. Um, if you're familiar with Libyan glass, okay, the tectites that come from Libya and Egypt, this was from an asteroid impact that formed in the Sahara Desert. So basically it hit white sands, okay, or the rocks that created the white sands. So the Libyan glass is kind of a pale yellow in color. If you go to the Czech Republic, you see the tectites, um, you know, basically stuff called moldavite, those are kind of a beautiful green color that has a higher concentration of iron. In fact, tectites look a lot like green bottle glass. In a lot of cases, uh, fake tectites are made from bottle glass or something like. Okay, then if you look at the tectites that come from um, Asia to Australia, that's what they call uh, basically indigenites or australocytes. They're black, you know, the most common tectite are black. They have a super high iron content. And you'll see the same thing in glass, basically the same, you know, in manufactured glass. You, by increasing the iron content, you, you can deepen the color. Okay, there's lots of cool ones. We'll talk about some of them. I talked a little about blues in glass. Uh, cobalt is very well known as the cobalt blue. Uh, that's a very rich color. It's uh, very desirable, you know, very dark. Um, cobalt obviously is, you know, pretty desirable in glass, but it's also desirable in gemstones. Uh, for example, some of the uh, beautiful spinels that are coming out of Vietnam and some other areas are, are rich cobalt blue spinels. And they're super, I mean, rich blue, very high uh, cost for them now. Very, very desirable. Um, well, that's one analog again with gemstones. Um, if you're making glass and you don't want that really dark blue, you can make light to medium blues by using copper, basically copper carbonate, um, basically azurite, okay? If you know what azurite looks like, it's kind of light to medium blue. Um, you add it to glass and that's what you get as a color. So, I mean, again, these minerals, um, you know, there's a direct correlation in colors between glass and minerals. Here's a beautiful example of cobalt blue glass. 
Okay, now here's, there's a lot of different formulas. Here's one again from this Thomas Dugan, uh, his journals, which are great. These are basically, you'll use their, their basic batch as they call it, the, the basic uh, things they put in the sand and the, what they call the pearls or the dolomite and all the other things they add it. But this is the variations and how they change the color uh, to get various shades of blue. And it's interesting because if you look at it, here you've got four different colors of blue that were done. This was in 1898. So this is, you know, this goes back a little ways. And we're talking this amount of colorant per 100 pounds of the clear glass, basically. So to make a royal blue for every 100 pounds of the batch or, or the basic glass mixture, you needed three ounces of cobalt and two or four ounces of, of uh, copper oxide. That's seven ounces out of a hundred pounds. That's a pretty small percentage, and you get a royal blue out of that. If, if you have what's called a pressing blue, which is a light blue that was used in what they made press glass, is a black oxide of copper. That's used in the mineral tenorite, and you use only one quarter ounces per one hundred pounds. Casing blue, which is a little bit darker, a little bit of cobalt, as well as uh, copper oxide. In fact, that's a dark one. And then a different type of royal blue, which they call Venetian, was basically cobalt, what they call copper scales, which I believe was a copper sulfide. And again, very small amounts to get that. So you can see that you don't need a lot of the coloring agent to create these rich colors in, in the glass, just like the same thing in, in minerals and gemstone. You know, a fraction of a percent is more than adequate color. Here's an idea of the green colors you can get. Uh, again, you can use copper oxides to get green. In this case, it'd be uh, malachite rather than azurite. Uh, a certain silver, silver nitrate will, in a certain concentration, will color uh, glass green. And of course, chromium, if you want an emerald green. Of course, we all know chromium uh, colors a lot of gemstones like emerald, like um, basically praise. Uh, you know, chrysoprase. Also, we'll do plasma agate. If anyone went on the recent trip that I think the searchers did and some other groups up to um, Clear Creek area, that's one thing they're looking for was the, uh, basically some of the beautiful, uh, you know, agates and jaspers up there, which are colored by chromium. And that, that's material that's coming out of the serpentines and the rocks up there. Okay. Here's a nice light green that's sort of probably being colored by uh, basically copper oxides. That was a Fenton glass piece, by the way. Okay, one of the very common ones is a purple glass. Um, if you look at it, it's called amethyst glass, which of course you can see it. It's uh, colored by manganese. And uh, of course, amethyst itself is colored by manganese. So again, the very big similarities. Of course. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, glass itself is about 70% quartz, basically, in its composition. So it's not surprising that, you know, these elements have the same effect on glass versus. Okay, anyway, if you want to make a light dark purple, you can use pyrolusite, which is basically manganese oxide or a manganese silicate. Um, we, most people have, have used manganese sil silicate as far as cabbing it or, or something like that, because it's um, basically rhodonite, okay, which we usually see as kind of a pink color. But if, if you add it in a pure form, manganese silicate, you'll end up with a, a light to dark purple. If you wanna make black glass, there's really no glass that's truly black. It's actually a very dark purple. So you can take a glass that looks black and put an intense light up to it and it's a dark purple. And that is using large amounts of manganese and iron oxides um, will cause that very deep, almost black color, at least in appearance. Okay, another one that we see occasionally is orange glass. Uh, the most common element used is cadmium sulfide, which uh, cadmium is toxic. So you're not gonna see that kind of stuff in most drinking glass. They're using some other stuff now for that, but traditionally it was cadmium. Uh, this is actually the mineral granachite, which is kind of a yellowish green mineral when you see it in nature. 
but uh, cadmium sulfide, the chemical version, would create an orange glass. Okay, one of my favorites is ruby glass. Uh, this is a very rich red glass. Uh, ruby glass is very expensive. And the reason is it is made with, with gold. Uh, basically, uh, usually what they would use is gold chloride to make it. And again, it's another Dugan glass formula where they have it's a little, about a thousand pound batch as they call it. And to make this bright red rich glass, you use sand, you use some lead, uh, pearls or dolomite, saltpeter, something called crocus, which is antimony sulfides and oxides. Well, antimony sulfides are stibnite. So anyone who's with a silvery gray mineral, the long, elongate crystals, that was used in this. Um, another antimony, other sources, um, including, you know, what they call regulus, which I think is elemental, the antimony oxide, which would be minerals like cervantite and things like that. A little bit of manganese, a little bit of borax, which is the, uh, basically the flux to help it melt. Uh, white oxide of lime, basically, that's just your typical lime like you'd use in cement. And this way, it also said gold. It's interesting, in those days, they didn't use an amount um, as you typically by weight, but they used it by the dollar value. So in this case, for a 1,000 pound batch of glass, they'd use $45 worth of gold. Now at that time, gold, I believe, was probably $16 an ounce. That was almost three ounces of, of gold that had to be used to make the ruby formula. So you can see that's a little expensive compared to the typical things they might have used. In fact, that was probably worth more than all the rest of the ingredients combined. Ruby glass, uh, again, goes back to around the, I think, we started making ruby glass around the uh, 1840s, 1850s. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was extremely popular. Uh, some beautiful pieces, what they call sometimes cranberry glass, uh, was made with this gold. That's one of the variants. Okay, now, because gold's very expensive, they had to come up with some options. Here's a beautiful glass, also called a ruby glass, but this is a non-gold formula. And this is something that became popular uh, during World War II and afterward. In fact, there's a company called Anchor Hockey in the 1950s that made tons and tons of items in this red glass or a green glass, almost look like Christmas colors. And um, they used a combination of selenium, cadmium, and sulfur, or a copper chloride, basically, to make this glass. And again, it looks beautiful. It's a very nice color, but it is a little bit different than the classic uh, ruby glass to contain, to contain gold. Still very nice. Okay, there's some other things you can use, like pink. Um, you know, obviously, Pink is a sort of variant of red. You, if you have less additives to it, like for example, a pink sapphire is less chromium basically than a ruby would, uh, some things like that. Pink spinel, same thing. In this case, um, you can add less gold than you would a normal red glass formula, or you use a combination of selenium and neodymium. Neodymium is one of those rare earth elements that are so important to the electronics industry, you know, computer technology. Uh, solar cells. I mean, all kinds of applications uh, for these things right now. So, and so this is again, you know, the new variants include a lot of really interesting metals, a lot of high tech metals. Okay, then there are some other variants which are not necessarily the color so much as there are different types of effects. Um, there's a type of glass called uh, opal glass, or you know, it's a type of Milk glass is the, the general uh, term, where it's kind of a white glass. And in some cases, it's opaque. Other cases, it's milky, almost opalescent. And there are several formulas that were used. And uh, if you look at the old style milk glass, the, the, the stuff that people really like as far as antique glass, it started around the 1880s, 1890s. I, it was it used several minerals. One was cryolite with fluorite, 
and uh, what's called sodium sil silica fluoride. And when you look at it on the edge, it looks sort of whitish, but when you look at the edge, it's opalescent, usually with sort of a pale yellowish uh, opalescence to it. And then there's a newer formula that uses feldspar in case, that, I'm sorry, in replacing the cryolite. That is the more traditional opaque white that you saw used if like my grandmother collected uh, the white opaque uh, milk glass. A lot of that was made in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s by companies like Westmoreland and those. And it's interesting because um, the reason the change in formula had to do with the mineral cryolite. Cryolite came from one mine in the world. And that was it. It came from Greenland. And the deposits started to play out in the 1950s. And by 1972 or something like that, the, the mine was completely shut down. No more left in the world. They have since made, uh, started to make cryolite synthetically because that's a lot of industrial applications, but that pretty much put an end to its use in the glass industry. So again, here's another one. You can kind of date glass as far as some of the, for the art glass anyway. Um, by, you know, when cryolite basically became unavailable. And uh, the all opalescent glass is beautiful. It's one of my favorites, actually. Here's a couple pieces of opalescent glass. There's a clear, and this is a, the one on the left is kind of a yellow screen that's called canary. Uh, that in itself is an interesting one because that material is colored by uranium as an additive. Um, but yeah, if you look at it on edge, you can see it's kind of a bluish to yellowish, um, sort of a weird opalescence to it. Quite attractive and very collectible. Here's the newer milk glass. This is some stuff that you know we would have more likely grown up with than our parents or grandparents. Um, the more traditional so started to become very popular in the 1950s and by companies like Westmoreland that you up for it. I never really cared much for this one. Now, in addition to opalescent glass, there's a type called iridescent glass. And this is the stuff that I talked about very early in the talk, where they're trying to emulate the uh, ancient glasses that were found at archaeological sites. You know, like Tiffany had their Fabrio glass, uh, Duguay Glass Company had their brand they called Pompeii glass. And then uh, companies like Fenton and some others in the early 1900s made their versions, which by the night, they call them iridescent glasses, but by the 1920s and 30s, they became known as carnival glass. And that's kind of a derogatory term um, as it fell out of fashion about 25 years after they started making it. Uh, anyway, here's a beautiful Favreal uh, vase from Tiffany. Again, these things, some of them are thousands of dollars a piece. Um, very extremely high quality glass. And this is a coating that was applied to the glass where after the glass was made, this is a, usually metallic coatings that were added, um, almost like sprayed on when the glass was still hot. Okay, so it's a, you know, microns thick layer of these metal oxides and chlorides and things like that that were added to the exterior of the glass to give it this color. So it will wear off, you can scrape it off, things like that. So to find older pieces like this, that are this pristine is, is pretty remarkable and they ask, they come at a real high price for collectors more. Okay, anyway, Fenton Art Glass Company was a very innovative company. This is a company that got me started in glass, interesting glass, because they had a chemist who was, this guy was brilliant. He created all these different colors. And one of the things he, he really worked on was he came up with a process that made for inexpensive manufacture of this, you know, iridescent or became carnival glass. And the Tiffany method, a few of the other companies that, that made it early on, it was a very expensive process. This guy was innovative and he found a way to make it for a fraction of the cost. So now the average glass maker could produce this material and could sell it to the general public, not the wealthy you know, people at a reasonable price. I mean, Tiffany Glass, I mean, they had Tiffany customers. You know, these were wealthy people that had expensive taste and wanted the best. Um, 
Fenton Glass Company came up with the process to make it for the masses. And that's why it eventually became known as Carvel Glass because um, by the 1920s, everybody made it. It became so popular that actually people got sick of it. They'd seen so much of it. So then it became kind of something you win as carnival prizes. They give it away and boxes detergent and all that kind of stuff. And it fell out of favor in the 1930s. And that was replaced by a different type of glass that ended up being known as a depression glass. Anyway, but back to this, um, what, what they did is they found out where the glass was still hot. They could spray uh, chlorides of different elements onto the glass, you know, just a very thin film on this would give it these iridescent colors. So they had a, what's called a peach or marigold color, which is kind of an orangey uh, iridescence. That was iron chloride. You would get a silvery iridescence by doing tin chloride. And if you used a combination of tin and iron chloride, you get a blue iridescence. And uh, here's the, the marigold color which is quite pretty. It's very common. If you go to antique shops, you'll see this stuff all over the place. But this, this was an innovative thing that this Fenton Art Glass Company did, you know, in the early 1900s and kind of revolutionary the, um, basically the decorative and art glass industry in the U.S. There's the blue iridescent glass, which is quite nice. Again, that's an antimony chloride that's been sprayed on the outside of that stuff. And here's a, this is a cold one. Um, and there's some new, there's some new materials that are being used that they further improve it. But again, they're all based on the same. This is a, a recent piece. And you know, some of this stuff is just incredible with the iridescence. Now, I should say one other thing. Part of the color in these is based on the, the glass color that goes underneath it. For example, this is blue glass to start with and then the iridescence over it. Um, the marigold is generally clear glass with that over it. So the, the base or body color does have an effect on the overall appearance. And, and they take that into account depending on which formula they use. In this case, you have a marigold color over an amethyst colored glass. Okay. A couple other really cool ones. Uh, one of my favorites is the Vaseline or uranium glass. Uh, actually, it was originally called uranium glass or canary glass was the trade term that they use because I guess it's kind of yellow like a canary color. Um, they used about 2% uranium oxide in this thing, which gave it its really color. Part of the color is actually fluorescence uh, in light. Okay, um, obviously there became a time when you know, uranium in glass wasn't such a great idea, especially when they found out that a lot of uh, glass blowers were getting lung cancer from inhaling radon from uh, while they're blowing this glass. So they came up with a non-uranium formula that actually used manganese, which is real interesting. So uh, a chemical compound, including manganese, would give it this uh, non-uranium formula. And some of this will actually still fluoresce, but it's uh, instead of a real bright green, it was kind of a pale lime green. Okay, here's a typical uranium glass. This is a piece, I think this was a, this piece about 1903, 1904. Um, the left side, you're looking at the piece in natural light. Um, there actually is a tiny bit of fluorescence in this because it's exposed to sunlight. So you're seeing a little bit of the uh, fluorescence caused by the ultraviolet in the sun. The picture on the right shows it under, you know, a in, intense uh, ultraviolet light source. Um, these are great pieces. I've seen, you know, a lot of uranium glass uh, exhibited at mineral shows. Because basically the uranium they're using in there would be similar to the mineral autunite, which of course is uh, one of the uranium minerals that's very common and has that beautiful sort of a yellow green color, very, very intense and is highly fluorescent. Okay, there's a, another cool type of glass called custard glass or ivory glass. And this is an interesting one. This is co combining two different things. There's a lot of things where they mix, for, you know, uh, different processes to come up with new variants. In this case, custard glass, which is, was very popular in the early 1900s, was a combination of the opalescent glass using the, the mineral cryolite as one of the main ingredients and adding uranium to it. So it gave it a very distinctive color. It wasn't your typical sort of white opalescent glass. 
it's this kind of a, what they call almost a custard color. And you can see that little bit of yellowish in it. Well, again, that is from the uranium that's been added to it. And as you would expect, under ultraviolet light, it fluoresces just like uh, the other uranium glasses do. But again, you know, they're very innovative in mixing different concepts and coming up with new materials. But again, this is one that used, you know, two fairly unusual uh, elements in the glass making industry or minerals, both the cryolite and uranium, and was extremely popular. And these are very pricey items from, you know, the turn of the last century. This is, um, this piece is probably a Northwood uh, glass company piece. These were I made between about 1898 and about 1905 or 1908. So, you know, well over 100 years old. So very collectible in their own right. Okay, and then of course there's stained glass, which is a combination of all different kinds of glass. This really, to me, is kind of the ultimate in using glass as an art form. You're taking all the different colors and you're combining them and just make beautiful scenes of various types. And, you know, the churches in the medieval churches in uh, Europe had an awful lot to do with influencing glass technology because of the uses in, say, stained glass windows and things like that. So really, the, the religious applications of this, you know, which was high demand for very skilled glass makers and glass chemists, this actually helped expedite the development of glass technology because of its use, you know, for religious purposes. But it's always interesting how certain things spur development. So, um, yeah, but yeah, so, so you gotta give a lot of credit to the medieval churches for actually helping increase the development and the, the breadth of, of skills in the glass making industry just to make these beautiful things. Okay, and that is my talk. I'm gonna get out of here and I'm gonna go to stop share. And uh, I guess if anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We do, we have a question from Linda. Um, can sel selenium leach out of glass? You know, it's not as soluble as say the lead is. It will leach out, although the concentrations of selenium are not very high. You remember in the case of lead, leaded glass, you're talking about 24% lead in the glass, okay? Selenium is probably like maybe 1% or half a percent. So the concentration is pretty low. So it's not near nearly a risk the way say lead would be in the glass as far as leaching. Okay, that was the only question that was in the chat box, but please okay. uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves and go ahead and ask. Walter I have a question. question. Yes. Walter, what about Alexandrite glass? Oh, that's there's a couple of cool ones there. Yeah, I mean, Alexandrite, and there's another one similar to that called Mulberry glass. Mulberry, I didn't know. Alexandrite, yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I'm trying to think. That one is, of course, some of these things, there you go. Can't see, yeah. you can't see it in this light, but it changes from a reddish purple to like a blue. Yep. Yeah, well, that's the thing is, of? because of rare earth elements in there. In that case, I think it's crazy dimium, I think of that one. Uh, or is it maybe neodymium? Maybe neodymium, maybe? Neodymium, because that's also used in the pink glass, yeah. But in a lot of cases, the rare earth elements, number one, they're very hard to separate from each other. So I think in many cases that, there is some crazy neodymium in with the neodymium. But um, that's a really cool, and again, you know, they didn't really start separating the, the rare earth elements with any great success until the 1940s uh, for industrial purposes. So they, and that's a more recent uh, glass, which sort of like the new pink glass, which is primarily a neodymium. Oh, but yeah, that's, there's a lot of um, new technology you know, and research in chemistry, glass chemistry is a huge issue. I mean, there's a lot of uh, innovative uses for glass, not only for things like windows and glassware and things, but I mean, in things like storage of nuclear wastes and, you know, all kinds of architectural applications where you need, you know, high strength glass. You look at the, um, that um, 
because it's on the Havasu Reservation in over the part of the Grand Canyon or, or these, you know, that walkway in China or over the, the river where they are using the super high, you know, strength glasses where you're actually walking, you know, over like a gorge or something that's, you know, like 3,000 wow. feet deep or something like that. So you have to, fiberglass is another one where they've added a borosilicates to a typical glass mix to give it flexibility to increase the, what they call the coefficient of, uh, of expansion where you can add, you know, you can heat or cool the glass without it breaking. Like one of the biggest tech advances really in food storage um, was the making a board silicate glass, also used in test tubes and things like that. But they found that, you know, and of course, California is one of the leaders in uh, borate production, you know, from boron needs to be Death Valley, uh, where Borax. you use the uh, borosilicate silicate glass to make things like fiberglass. Uh, so everything from skateboards and surfboards to home insulation, uh, to, you know, the bodies of certain types of sports cars are made with fiberglass. But then you also have things like fiber optic cable, which is, is almost the same thing, a little different formula. Where, and if you look at Ulexite and uh, satin spar gypsum, you see how the light is transmitted through the crystal structure. Well, they emulated that with uh, basically fiber optic cable. So right. that came, that innovation, the glass industry came by looking at natural minerals that, you know, happen to be found right here in California, for example. So there's a lot of neat applications, you know, in glass that are finding super high tech uses. Um, some of the, the glass, and, you know, ceramics and things like that that are used. Uh, there's all kinds of applications. Yes, next. Um, hi, I have a question. Thank you. I thought that your talk was very interesting. Oh, I noticed you. that old CRT television glass, it's really thick. You see it broken on, out in the desert. And so yeah. um, actually has a dim fluorescence in it. And I'm wondering if there's something, is it leaded or is there some other property? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. Actually, there is lead in the glass because a CRT is a cathode ray tube. You know, in the old days, CRTs were used to, to generate X-rays and things like that, okay? They're producing high energy particles. And what you do is, as you're taking the, um, the cathode rays, I mean, basically those are like X-rays almost, okay? You're just taking, you know, these particles and shooting them at the screen. So what you do is you have a phosphor or a, um, basically a fluorescent coating on the back of the screen. And as that's being zapped by the, the CRT, that's creating the old images. Now, we don't use that anymore. Now we have these, you know, high tech screens that, you know, basically have pixels and basically liquid crystals and other kinds of things that we use. But yeah, I mean, the old days they used leaded glass and that was to protect you from the radiation that was generated by the cathode ray tube in that screen. So, yeah, ancient technology now, but uh, it was, you know, useful for about 70 years. Terry had a question, didn't you, Terry? I was wondering uh, about dichroic glass. They use that mm -hmm. a lot in the arts and crafts industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the dichroic glass, the glass itself does not have color. Okay, usually it's sort of a sandwich. It's usually a multi-layer glass with a very thin layer of metallic oxides or a metallic foil that's sandwiched within the glass. Okay, a typical type of dichroic glass would be a, a layer of the borosilicate glass on top, a very high temperature, you know, very um, hard but durable glass. Then you have this thin metallic film and underneath you'll have black or maybe cobalt glass and they're all fused together. And so the color is actually created primarily, the, the, what they call dichroic color, is created by the metal foil that's sandwiched in between the layers of glass. And so when you heat it, you stretch it, you're actually stretching that, that glass, that metallic film. So the glass itself would either be the background is usually the black or blue, but uh, the wild colors are actually caused by a metal film that's sort of squeezed in between the two layers of glass. So it's not the glass itself is doing, it's just the glass is the vehicle to hold the film together so you can you know, do things with it. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Hi, Hi well, this Mary Pat here. I have a question yeah. about the journals. Uh, I noticed there were many pounds of pearls in those formulas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular source location or type that was preferred and is it used today? Well, you know, it's funny because I looked at that. I thought the same thing, but actually pearls refer to uh, basically compounds similar to dolomite. Basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, calcium, magne magnesium uh, carbonate. And they just, they, it was called pearls. If you look at a dolomite crystal, like say the ones from the Midwest, they've got that kind of iridescent sheen to them. That's where the term comes from. It, they didn't actually use pearls. They used uh, dolomite, basically. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but I, I thought the same thing. I did a little research to figure that one out. Some of the names are, you know, pretty archaic. Um, but yeah, like, you know, crocus of antimony. Like, what the heck is that? You know, it turns out that like, crocus flowers are kind of what, an orangey yellow. So, I mean, you look at uh, crocoite, for example. Well, you, you know, you can see similarities in colors, but yeah, but pearls refers actually to uh, dolomite in the mix. Okay, thank there's you. Question. In in Venice, um, you know, there's goldstone glass, which is glass. But in mm. Venice, I heard that the goldstone, the beads that they did, you know, with were an accident. That somebody spilled copper in some glass, yeah. a copper mm. powder, and it began sparkly little beads and they liked it, so they made a bunch of it yeah have you ever heard yeah. that oh yeah that's that, i think that's probably true um anyway and you know it's called um interesting because it's called aventurini but the term aventurine which you know we like as quartz with mica in it actually um that, that name was utilized in you know venice or you know murano f f to initially describe that type of glass yeah but, you know, actually, yeah, in fact, it's kind of funny because the copper crystals in glass would also emulate sunstone, like Oregon sunstone now. Exactly. So, so, yeah, a little kind of interesting coincidences uh, with different materials having sort of similar appearances in a way. See the oops that turned out to be kind of cool. Yeah. Well, there's a Anyone lot of else have any? <laughs> Anybody else have any questions for? Uh, um, hi, it's yes. Scott again. Hi. I have another question about sure. glass. The, the auto darkening, you know, glass lenses that people mm -hmm. use. Um, that do you know anything about that? You know, I don't know much. I mean, there are some elements that um, will change. Photoreactive. Yeah, the photoreactive glasses. I'm not sure what they use. I know there's different formulas. Some I think are mineral, but I think some are more uh, sort of weird chemical agents, not necessarily metal agents in, in some of these. You know, I mean, you know, there are a lot of minerals that will change color, like silver minerals, for example. Um, there's a number of them that are basically will change, mostly darken with this. But the thing about these, you know, photoreactive glasses, they had to come up with a process where it can darken and the, but then reverse. We're dealing with minerals, the process doesn't reverse. So, you know, I, I'm not sure. I know some of that's proprietary technology. Uh, I'm sure there's some, I really haven't spent that much time researching that one, but that's actually a good point. I'd be worth looking at and seeing what is, you know, public knowledge as far as that. I'm sure there's a fair amount, but I'm sure there's still some big trade secrets. In fact, it's funny, when I met with a glass chemist at Fenton Art Glass, so this was back in the 90s, um, there was a lot of things that would tell me in general terms, but even they didn't share their formulas or anything like that. I mean, this even in the 90s, they're still very secretive about these things. Those are considered important trade secrets. You know, if you have a glass with a very unique color, and uh, there were some companies that were very innovative. And the original glass chemist for Fenton was one of those guys. He had worked for a previous company that had a very glamorous name. And he had originally worked for the Indiana Goblet and Tumbler Company, which uh, was a little company that was north of Indianapolis. It was a little town called Greentown, uh, Indiana. This guy was brilliant. And he invented about 10 new colors of glass. And uh, unfortunately, the factory only lasted about seven years. Uh, interesting about uh, glass factories in the US. And you know, a lot of 
this research I did and for the exhibit I did was on the American glassmaking industry, especially in kind of the heyday from about the 1890s to the 1930s when there was a huge explosion of glass facilities, the technology improved and there were some driving factors that, that caused it to be pervasive in the Eastern US. One was there were a lot of great glass sand sources, nice, clear, all right, clear, clean, white, you know, sand that could be utilized in places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, places like that through the upper Northeast. And then it was the proliferation of natural gas. Um, when they started discovering natural gas fields and, you know, again, in the uh, upper Midwest, that was the fuel that was used to, to the, for the glass factories. And in fact, cities or towns were giving the rights to natural gas where they were finding these fields in places like Ohio, Illinois, you know, Kentucky, West Virginia, all these places, two glass companies to get them to relocate there. The problem is the glass making technology and the, the building technology were quite a bit different in those days. Many of the glass factories were in wooden buildings. Wooden buildings, making glass using natural gas, high heat, molten materials, and not always a good mix. And there was a huge number of fires that burned factories to the ground. Anyway, this uh, Indiana Goblet Tumbler Company uh, did that. And I think it was 1903 or 1904, a factory burned to the ground. They were an incredibly innovative company. Their glass maker or the, the glass chemist was brilliant. Anyway, he got picked up by Fenton Art Glass Company, which was a startup at that time, and he continued to make these great uh, colors of glass, things like chocolate glass and all these other things that are highly sought after. And some of those formulas have never adequately been reproduced. Um, wow. he, he took his formulas with him to the grave. But again, this period in the early 1900s where there's this huge innovation in glass colorants that was quite remarkable. And actually... Um, being a rock hound uh, geologist and had to travel quite a bit with my jobs in the past, I actually got to visit the site of this Indiana Goblet and Tumbler Company, which kind of revolutionized at least uh, the coloring agents in US glass making industry. Um, I was there, I think in 2008, I got to, I actually went to the site of the factory. Believe it or not, it's a field. It's never been built on. It's right next to this little tiny police substation in uh, Greentown, Indianapolis. And you can go out there in this little field and you can collect shards of glass from, you know, wow. from like 1903, basically, which was really cool. They destroyed most of their inventory and all that stuff. But it's really cool. Being a rock hound, you know, I picked up about, I think about, maybe 20 pounds of glass shards from there. I still have the bags, I color separate them, everything. They've been sitting in a box for, I'd say it for what, 12 years now. Uh, actually kept, make kind of a cool sea glass if everyone wanted to do that. But uh, it's just really cool to have, you know, some of the pieces from this. So like going to an old mine site and going through the mine dumps, I guess. So. Any yeah. other questions for the master here? Walt, well then. We have to thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Excellent talk, as Thanks. usual. Wonderful. Oh, you bet. Marjorie. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm actually thinking about resurrecting my exhibit. I was going to approach the Bowers someday and see if they'd want to do it. It was, it, was, it was a fun exhibit. It was pretty cool. So I may that actually cool. try to do that at some point. Oh, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you're you. very welcome. Well, we want to thank you again. Gary, our president. Great program. Oh, thank you, Gary. And uh, uh, definitely look forward to another one. Okay. Yeah, anytime. Okay. Go by and visit Walt at Nevada Mineral and Book Company on uh, Tustin, just by, um, um, what is the C Street? Chapman. Yeah. Just below Chapman. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Pick up some fulgurite. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Thank you, Walt. All right. You guys have a great day. Thanks so much. You too. Good Thank night. Thank you. Take care. Good night. All right. Bye. Right. Let's <laughs> here we go. Get out of here. <laughs>